All right, all right. Thanks for joining me on this episode of The Gospel Truth. I'm your host, Marla Wilson, and I thank you so much for joining me. I know we had a little bit of delay there, but we were just fine-tuning so we could put the best show on for you today, and I thank you for joining me. As always, I do want to encourage you to make sure you like and subscribe to Gospel Truth. Hit that notification bell so you don't miss out on any debates or any shows that are coming up here in the future. You don't want to miss out on anything because this, this platform has a whole bunch of debates and interviews that are coming up here, so the only way you can stay in loop and stay in and, and, and loop with the gospel that's going on is if you subscribe and hit that notification bell please do that uh the gospel truth is not only on youtube but we're also on facebook twitter instagram and tiktok so uh depending on what you like if you like little short piffy videos you might want to flow to tiktok and the same videos are on instagram if you like facebook and you want to see my post about my journal articles that i write and stuff like that you can get on facebook nonetheless all those social media platforms are there also if you just want those individuals who would like to just listen uh, to audio, we do have the audio option for you. Yeah, it's on podcast, so iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, Spotify. Make sure you flown over there to subscribe and follow on the gospel truth. Support the ministry with a follow, subscribe, and like on those platforms. All right. Uh, that said, we are going to go over some announcements here of shows that are coming up here in the future. Uh, as you know, uh, this debate is actually taking place today. I didn't update my slides, so forgive me for that. But there is a part two of this very debate that is coming up here next week. So make sure if you're going to check out part one today, make sure you check out part two. You don't want to miss out on it because it's a continuation. You don't want to just forget about one and forget about the other, right? Make sure you come over here and you check out part two of this same debate that's going down next week, all right? After that, I have does the Christian God exists. I have David Palman and Leo. They're going to be joining me. So make sure you check that debate out. This debate is going to be great. And hopefully you can join us. After that, I have an interview confronting heretics. I have Corey Miner. He's going to be jumping on with me to go over some of the, the, the guys out there uh, that are definitely deceiving the church and misleading the church. So Corey's going to help me out and sift through all this stuff. And we're going to have fun with this show. All right. And then after that, uh, sorry, actually not, not after that, sorry. Uh, there is a, a fundraiser that the gospel truth is doing. We are trying to raise money for media equipment. As you know, the gospel truth does debates on you know, live debates in uh, live in different venues. And sometimes those venues do not have the media and audio equipment that we desire because we desire high quality, right? So if you are open to the idea of supporting the gospel truth by helping us uh, accure money to buy media, traveling media equipment, it will be greatly appreciated. All right, so if you're interested, the link to this 
fundraiser is in the description of this video. So please make sure you jump on that. All right. Uh, that's it. Uh, I, once again, I have uh, Bishop Jerry Hayes with me and I have Albi Al with me, the Assyrian guy. All right. I have a guy having good with me and we're going to be having an interesting discussion. It's going to be a great debate uh, concerning another triune debate, basically uh, discussing is God one or three persons. All right. So this is going to be a fun debate. Uh, hopefully you was able to join us last week uh, where we had a two on two debate sort of dealing with the same subject matter. Right. And and I pray that you enjoyed that debate. Uh, but today I have Bishop Jerry Hayes and I have Albie Al with me. And so let me bring these guys in so they can introduce themselves to y'all. How y'all doing, guys? How you doing? By the grace of God, we're doing well, Marlon. Thanks for having us. All right, all right. Thanks for us on here, Marlon. And uh, amen. Uh, by all the right. grace of God, all is well. All right. All right, all right, definitely, definitely. All right, cool, guys, thank you for joining me. And so what we're gonna do before we jump into this debate, because we don't wanna leave the audience waiting too long, I'm gonna give you a chance to introduce yourselves to the audience, let them know what you do, blogs, website, YouTube channel, wherever you're at, let them know so they can come check you out, all right? Start with Bishop Jerry Hayes, if you don't mind, give a quick introduction to yourself. Well, my name is Jerry Hayes. I pastor the Apostolic Orthodox Church in Lexington, Tennessee. Uh, that's about it. I am a oneness known historically as a modalistic monarchy and apologist. And I'm here today to, uh, in this particular session, to listen to my friend Al and give his affirmatives and give answers to his affirmatives as best as I can. All right. Sounds good. Thank you so much for joining me, Bishop Jerry Hayes. Uh, next up, Albie. Go ahead, give a quick introduction to yourself. All right. Thanks for having me. So my name is Albie Al. Um, I've been a online evangelist. You know, on top of that, what I can do outside of, uh, you know, the online community. My <clears throat> goal, by the grace of God, is to demonstrate and to show that God is by nature is a multi-personal God, namely three. And the heart of our faith is who God is. That's the very heart of our faith. So in order to build up faith, my brothers and sisters, we need to identify who God is. And God is the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And the heart of our salvation is in the gospel and both depend and on an accurate understanding of the scriptures. So my goal is to build up the faith of my brothers and sisters and to win over those who do not know the true God as he's revealed himself in the scriptures. And that's what I'm hoping to do tonight by the grace of the living God. All right. All right, guys. Thank you so much. Once again, both of you for joining me tonight. And so we're going to get into this debate. Uh, the premise that's being debated tonight is basically is God one or three persons. All right. And so we're going to, uh, we're going to open that up with uh, the way that this is going to be structured audiences. That's going to be a little bit different than what we typically see on the gospel truth. So first, uh, the affirmative is going to open up with a 20 minute opening and then that's going to be followed by a negative. The negative is going to go for its 20 minutes. So it's going to be three segments of 20 minutes each. So these first three segments for each party will be about two hours. And then we're going to follow that, uh, with a 30 minute cross X cross-examination where both parties will get 30, uh, 15 minutes each to ask questions. And, uh, and then we're going to follow that with a possible Q&A, uh, depending on how the debaters feel at the end of all that. So audience, it's not promised that we're going to have a Q&A once again, So, but we'll keep you up and let you know if we're going to do that final Q&A, all right? That said, Albie Al, you are up first for your 20-minute opening there. And then we, then uh, let me pull you up real quick and um, I'll start your time when you begin to speak. All right, glory to the triune God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So the preposition which I'm affirming today is gonna to be that God is one God ontologically, co-equally, co-eternally existing as three eternal uh, persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. 
starting with that understanding, when we think person, we think one who is of a human kind. But that's not what the scripture references when we speak about persons. By persons, we mean that he is personal and not impersonal. So the one God is personal, not impersonal. All three persons are personal, not impersonal. And one of the ways in making this known throughout the scriptures, you'll notice that we will find to see personal possessive pronouns being used of the one God. Like, for example, you'll see that the father is being called his father or his son or his spirit. These terms are references to the one God in relation to one another, that one God being a family within himself, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Ontologically, they are co-equal. Positionally, the Father would be greater than the Son. The Father would be greater than the Spirit by virtue of position. Just like my Father would be greater than I by virtue of him being uh, positionally greater, right? Or my boss is greater than I by virtue of what? Positionally. However, we are equal in value and in dignity. So with that being said, excuse me, I'd like to start off with um, a very important passage from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5, the first of the greatest commandments. Deuteronomy 6, Verse 4 and 5 says, Hear, O Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. You shall love Yahweh your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. That's the first and greatest commandment. In order to understand and identify who this Yahweh is, well, Moses doesn't leave us in the dark. He doesn't leave us until Deuteronomy to figure out or until the New Testament to figure out who this one God is. He prepares us for in the book of Genesis in itself. So what I'm going to do, starting off with Genesis chapter 11, I'm going to go over that word achad for a minute. Notice again, hero Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one. Now, automatically people think one, one person. No, no, no. Nowhere does it say one person. It doesn't say 10 persons or five persons. What's being said here is that there is no other God besides the true God, right? In exclusion to all other false deities. There are gods and there are many lords, but these are all false deities. All of them are created. There's only one who is uncreated, who created all things. Well, let's find out. Let's segue into who the creator is by first starting off by going to Genesis chapter 11. And I'm going to start reading from uh, four in Genesis Chapter 11, at the Tower of Babel, here's what we see. And they, meaning the inhabitants of uh, Babel, and they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and tower whose top is to the heavens. Let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. Number one, notice the language that's being used here. Number one, let us make a name for ourselves, right? Then it goes on to say, but Yahweh came, but Yahweh came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. And Yahweh said, indeed, the people are one and they all have one language. So Yahweh comes down and he sees that their name is one and that their tongue is one again and Yahweh said indeed people are one so how can more than one person be one well that's exactly the point the multi the, the multiplicity of people persons are actually all one at the Tower of Babel with one language and the language that's being used here let us make a name for ourselves that's one name a multiplicity of persons right this language is found also as you all know in genesis chapter 1 verse 26 but before we get to 26 i'd like to read genesis chapter 1 verse 2 where it says that the earth was without form and void 
And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now that verb, hovering, is used in one other place in the Torah, and that's in Deuteronomy chapter, 30, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11. Now let me read that for you so I can explain exactly what is taking place here. So when we go to Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 11, here's what's being said. As an eagle stirs up its nest, hovers over its young, spreading out its wing, taking them up, carrying them on its wings, so Yahweh alone led him, and there was no foreign god uh, with him. So notice how Yahweh is being likened on to the spirit that's being that's hovering over the water. And in verse three, what do we have? Let there be light. The first thing you got to think about for yourself is you're a first generation Israelite coming out of captivity and you're reading Moses's writing and you see this writing and you see God in verse three saying, let there be light. Well, after who was he speaking to? Number one, you would have to assume that verse two, he's speaking to the spirit who has cognition in order for it to hover over its young. So in the beginning, what we see is God and his spirit presenting himself, making the earth a habitable and a livable place. Now, that verb hovered, like I said, is the same word that's used in Deuteronomy 32, 11, which references an eagle spreading its wings to protect its young by hovering over the young in order to sustain them, to preserve them, and to oversee them in life. Now, the eagle must have cognition so that it may protect and preserve the nest by spreading out her wings to hover over the nest. Likewise, the Spirit of God hovered over the gaseous earthly state to oversee and superintend the formation of the earth in order to make the earth a habitable place for life to be sustained and so that life may flourish. So <clears throat> that's what we see. And throughout the days of creation, we see God saying, let there be. Again, speaking to someone, he can't be speaking to his divine counsel, right? Because he already, he already started speaking in verse 3 before any angels were made or before anybody was made. So now the question is, who was he uh, speaking to? It must be the Spirit of God. Now, by the time we get to uh, Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, now we notice the language changes when it comes to the creation of man. And here's what's being said here. Then God said, let us, not I say, let us make man in our image according to our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish, over the sea, over the birds of the air and over the cattle, over all that the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image, in the image of God, he created him singular, male and female created them plurality. <clears throat> male and female created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply. So we see from the very beginning, God speaking to someone in creation. Now, we have one other person who comes in on the scene in Genesis chapter 16 makes his first appearance as the angel of the Lord and claims to also have power to create. Now, this one is none other than the pre-incarnate Lord Jesus Christ. I can make a strong case for this. Nevertheless, though, uh, let me see what we can do with the time allotted to me. In Genesis chapter 16, verse 10, notice what it says here. Genesis 16, 10, it says, then the angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they should not be counted for multitude. Notice he's claiming the divine prerogative in order to what? To create, I will multiply your descendants exceedingly so that they should not be counted for multitude. So here's the angel claiming to be able to <clears throat> multiply Hagar's descendants. And in the same chapter, a few verses later, verse 13, notice how Hagar identifies the angel, but notice how Moses identifies the angel as well. Here's Moses narrating by saying, 
Then she called the name of Yahweh who spoke to her. But wait a minute. It wasn't Yahweh speaking to her in this context. It was the angel of the Lord speaking to her. Well, Moses identified him as Yahweh because, again, the one God is more than one person, which is why he's the angel of the Lord. You'll never find a place in Scripture where somebody is being called the angel of the Lord or like Gabriel's called the angel of the Lord, where it is a reference to himself as a person, but it's always a messenger of someone else, right? Now, <clears throat> the angel of the Lord is also called the word of the Lord. We're going to go to a few more places in order to demonstrate and to show that the one God is more than one person, that one creator, that one maker is more than one creators, makers. And you'll see that throughout the Hebrew uh, scriptures. So that being said, let's go to now really quick Genesis chapter 2 verse 7 where we see, and Yahweh God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and to make a living being. So notice the, <clears throat> notice the language. Yahweh God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life in order for him to make Adam a being who is now adamant to construct in him a spirit that can animate him and to give him life. Well, he did so by virtue of the breath, breath being a metaphor for life. Without breath, you have no life. Now watch this. We're, what we're going to do now is go here in, got about eight minutes left. So in about, let's go here. We're going to go to Psalm chapter 33, verse 6, where it says, By the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made and all the host of them by the breath of his mouth. Now that word breath here, it's actually ruach. So it's by the ruach of his mouth, right? So by the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. Now the Greek version of the Hebrew scriptures here would render it in such a way where we would see that in Job 33, 6, we cannot escape the fact that it was by the logos, by the Logos, the heavens were made. Now we see this exact syntax by Peter in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 5, where it says, For this they willfully forget that by the Logos of God, by the word of God, the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. That means by the word who created all things, and that was Peter's theology, that it was by the word who created all things, that same word in Psalm chapter 33, verse 6, that created all things and by the breath of his mouth. Now, why we say the breath is distinct from the Father and from the word, yet united to the one God in essence, it's because according to Nehemiah 9, 6, Job 9, 8, and Isaiah 44, 24, God alone is attributed to creating all creation, to creating mankind. And yet the son himself says that he himself has the power to do this. <clears throat> when, you read, uh, when you read verses like uh, John chapter 5, 25 to 29, here's what it says. John 5, 25 to 29. It says here, notice what the son says. Then Jesus and, oh, I'm sorry, right here. In 25, most assuredly, I say to you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead will hear the voice of the son of God and those who hear will live. Well, that would have been a perfect time for him to say the voice of the father and they will live. But no, rather, it's the voice of the son of God, that same voice that called creation into existence, that called the spirit in order to formulate uh, a spirit within man and to create man. When we continue reading again in 28, it says, do not marvel at this for the hours coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Whose voice? The voice of the son. There's a clear distinction that's being made here. 
So when we go to uh, Psalm chapter 104, verse 29 to 30, let me go there. Psalm 104, 29 to 30, here's what it says. You hide your face, they are troubled. You take away their breath, they die and return to their dust. You send forth your spirit, they are created, and you renew the face of the earth. So when the spirit is sent forth, they are created. But the spirit never acts apart from himself, but in perfect union with the Father and the Son in creating all things. Now it's interesting because when we go to Job 31 verse 15, let me read this for you. In Job 31 verse 15. Here's what it says. Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fan fashion us in the womb? Well, guess what that word one is in the Hebrew? Achad. Did not the same Achad fashion us in the womb? Did not he who made me in his womb make them? Now that one who made all humanity is none other than the makers in which Job 35 verse 10 is very clear when it says, and let me pull this up for you. In Job 35 verse 10, it says, but no one says, where is God, my maker, who gives songs in the night? Now that word maker is actually a plural. If you go to Bible Hub and if you look at the plural format for this, it is a plural format. Therefore, it should read, but no one says, where is God, my makers? Now, this isn't something that I came up with and I made on my own, but rather this is something that the uh, Second Temple period Jews knew about. And these are what the Jews during the Talmudic period, right, were writing about. How can the one God be more than one person? How do we get around these verses so that we don't give Christians, right, the way in order to, you know, prof profane who the, who the one God is? This is Talmudic times, rabbis trying to come together and trying to explain away what the scriptures have said. Although the second temple period is very clear that that one God is more than one person, namely the Memra and his spirit. So with the two minutes that I have left uh, with me, let me go to Job 33, verse 4. And notice what it says here. Job 33, verse 4. Here's what it says. The Spirit of God has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Now notice, again, the Spirit gives life. This made me. This is Hebrew parallelism in order to denote the fact that, yes, the spirit made me and the spirit and the breath of the almighty gives me life, showing also a distinction in person between the almighty and the breath. And we see that throughout the scriptures. Now, because time is fleeting in my next uh, in my next 20 minutes, what I'm going to demonstrate is to show that that one God of Deuteronomy 6, 4 and 5 is also known as a, a multiplicity of persons who act and interact on behalf of Israel, who communicate with one another. And then from that point on, I'll segue into the New Testament. But in doing that, I pray that, you know, using this past 20 minutes, you'll be able to see that, yes, God is one by nature, but by nature, he's also a multi right. multi personal God. All right, Albie, that's uh, that's time right there. All right, Bishop Jerry Hayes, you're up for your first twenty minute segment, and I will start your time when you begin to speak. All right, permit me to arrange <clears throat> to arrange the visual here. We had a. I apologize for this, but we, we had to rearrange this in the beginning. Uh, 
knowing I would have to reposition my screen at some point. All right. We also have a delay here too. <clears throat> Okay, I'm ready. You can go. I want to greet you in the lovely name of Jesus. That name that is above every name in heaven and earth. I want to thank uh, Albie for agreeing to uh, have this discussion. I like Albie. He is uh, a very intelligent young man. And uh, he has a great zeal for what he understands to be truth. Sadly, however, uh, that, that he understands to be truth, we do not believe that the Bible can validate. And uh, I am just uh, really <clears throat> surprised that the proposition that he is affirming has not been, he did not introduce it, he did not uh, define its terms, and in a debate that is a very important thing to do, and uh, I really don't like using my time to present his uh, proposition. But his proposition is, be it resolved, the scriptures teach the one God to be three ontological, co-equal, co-eternal, rational, and uh, relational persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Traditionally, in a debate, he would have went through his proposition and he would define each phrase, each word, so that we know exactly what he means by person. He mentioned uh, it be a uh, person is something that is relational or um, uh, has uh, relations or, or relationships with, with others. That's a very vague definition, and it leaves me sort of scratching my head as to really what he means. What does he mean by uh, ontologically co-equal and co-eternal? Uh, does he mean that uh, there is only one ontological being that is Father, Son, Holy Ghost? Or does he mean that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are co-equal and co-eternal uh, ontological persons or ontological beings because who will deny that a person is a being now we understand that a person and a being has different definitions if we're going to define a being as that that has being a tree has a being a rock has a being we understand that philosophically but a person is also a being uh, i would uh, be interested and so would our listeners uh, in knowing if uh, Albie's uh, ontological nature or essence, I don't think that he really defined what that meant, but I would ask him, is his ontological one God, is it rational outside of his three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost? Is his one ontological essence or something uh sentient he didn't say so we don't really know uh, also uh albie did not present his three questions per our agreement that he signed by the way to present his three questions to me in his first speech he did not and uh, maybe he will correct that when he comes back so uh, I would have been glad to have responded to them in my first speech had he introduced them. So I will introduce my questions at this point to him, and maybe he will uh, respond to these. Uh, it, are your three persons I say? I say means God within themselves. Is the Father God within himself? Is the Son God within himself? Is the Holy Spirit God within himself? If not, then which of your three persons is Ase? Aseity is important in the worship of one God. The second question I want to ask is, does the Bible, is there a scripture anywhere that says that God is three? Uses the word three. Or I'll even be more generous and I'll say, is there a scripture anywhere 
that says that God is three in any in any uh, uh, form of the word tr three, such as try. I think that in uh, your first speech, uh, friend Albie, you said that God was triune. Where does the Bible say that? That's what we want to know. You have a proposition to prove, and your first speech fell short, way short of even addressing your proposition. Be it resolved, the scriptures teach the one God to be three ontologically co-equal, co-eternal, rational, and relational persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I, I would like to know that. And also I would like to know thirdly, my third question to you is, uh, do your three persons each have an individual consciousness, mind, that's what I mean by that, and will? Are there three of those? So those are my three questions. Now let me introduce my chart that I have up here called the parameter of truth. And I'd like for you, uh, Albie, and all of those that are watching this to know that there is a boundary of truth. Truth has boundaries. Error has none, as is said here. So if we are to... Uh, uh, establish truth, then we must stay within the boundaries of truth because error has no boundaries. You can go from here till doomsday with error, and that's really where you'll end up is doomsday. Jesus said this in John chapter 10 and verse 35. He said, the scriptures cannot be broken. So what we have in the word of God is a perimeter of interpretation. What that means is, is that any passage that you want to interpret and find the biblical meaning of, you have to interpret it within the perimeter of Scripture. And around this perimeter, I have, uh, if you look at it as a clock, I have 12 o'clock, 3 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 9 o'clock, and then all points in between. And I have crosses that designate each point, and these crosses represent perimeter markers. So any scripture that you want to have a biblical understanding of, you put it within the perimeter, and then you cannot violate any of these perimeter markers in your understanding, in your interpretation. And my friend has violated just about, well, many of these perimeter markers that are up here. Uh, that I have up here now. Now I want to. Uh, he made some some uh, assertions, and number one, let me say this: He mentioned the triune God. Where in the Bible does it mention a triune God? Uh, it's not in the Bible. It's extra biblical. As a matter of fact, now we we had sort of agreed between he and I that we would not go with extra biblical evidence to establish either the oneness or the Trinitarian faith, but we would try to stay within the scripture. Therefore, the perimeter of interpretation. Now, uh, but he used the word triune. So in using the word triune or Trinity, he went beyond scripture. He went extra biblical to get that word. The Trinity is uh, an arrived at doctrine. And since he opened the door to extra biblical information, then I have no other alternative but to walk through it. So when we look for the word Trinity or triune in relation to God, guess where you don't find it? You don't find it in the Holy Scripture. But where you do find it is in extra biblical uh, development of Trinitarian thought. A man by the name of Tertullian was the first one to really set forth a, uh, a triune paradigm for the economical Trinity. He used the word Trinitas. There was one other man who used the word, be be a form of the word before him, but Tertullian was the first one to use the word Trinitas. So because the word is extra biblical, the concept is extra biblical. You'll see that I have uh, 
put a ring around the perimeter of uh, interpretation uh, and a written trinity all around it. Now, what my friend must do, he must take his arguments, he must place them within the perimeter of interpretation, and then he must go from the perimeter to the trinity. Now, it is my contention that he cannot get there. He cannot get from the perimeter, uh, the perimeter of interpretation to his trinity because he cannot get through the boundary line because the perimeter is a boundary line that is bounded by perimeter markers. Each one is a solid concept or uh, uh, precept of the Holy Scripture of the Holy Word of God. Now, he said some things that was interesting. He talked about uh, a relational God. He talked about the God family. Now, what I'm wondering is if he can get from inside the perimeter to his God family, that is the Trinity. Can he get to it through the perimeter? Well, he must get to it without violating any of these perimeter markers. And he has started out violating many of them today. He talked about makers, and he may talk about husbands. He may talk about uh, Elohim being a plural form of God. And uh, I, I don't know, you know, all of the uh, uh, limits that my friend and those of his elk will go to to establish a God family. C can you believe it? A God family? And then he gets up here and wants us to, to believe, and he wants to pretend that he only believes in one God. What the truth, friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, and ladies and gentlemen, what the truth is, is his one God is only one God nature. And that one God nature is not sentient. That one God nature is just the nature. He, much as the human nature is a human nature. He talked about persons and he talked about being relational and uh, having relations with one another. Hence my third question. Do your three persons have a mind uh, independent uh, from each other? In other words, does the father have a mind? Does the son have a mind? Does the Holy Ghost have a mind? Does the Father have a will? Does the Son have a will? Does the Holy Ghost have a will? It's not the same will, but are uh, wills particular to the three persons? Because you see, to have relationship and to be relational, you must have a will to have that relation that is independent from the ones you are having a relation with. Also, you must have a mind that... Uh, will determine to have a relationship. And then you must have an emotion that will benefit from said relationship. So what I am getting at today is this. Does my friend really worship one God? Or does he worship three God persons that each is God in and of themselves, and they happen to share a one God nature, such as myself, and Alby and Marlon are all three human beings, but we share one humanity. So that's an interesting thing that I am wanting to know today. And I know that you are wanting to know as well. Because what I have heard so far is not the classical Trinity. And I've de been debating it for as long as most of you that are watching are alive. And that's not the classical Trinity. To introduce a God family, if that's not heresy, I do not know what is. A God family? Are you serious? Makers? More than one maker? Are you serious? Do you expect me to think, Brother Alby, that you are sober and you're talking about a God family and you're talking about a plurality of makers? and yet want to confess one God? Well, you might as well confess one God as you're confessing one, as you could confess one humanity. 
Now, one of the things that I want to point out is, and it's the purpose of my little visual up here, is that uh, when a uh, friend, Albie, and he is my friend, and I hope he remains so. By the way, any animosity that you might uh, uh, detect tonight is not between persons, neither from Albie nor from me. But any animosity that will be detected tonight will be toward a doctrine, toward a paradigm that teaches another Christ. So when we talk about the God family, uh, I want to look at uh, uh, eight, eight five, because he talked about God family and then he talked about person. Uh, he talked about the defin uh, the definition of person and how that we need to have a biblical definition of person. I agree with that, and uh, the term person is uh, uh, somewhat in flux, and there are many different. Uh, ideas, many different, uh, what should I say, definitions of the word person. But what I want to do today so that we can better ascertain what my opponent means by person and how he is actually using the term, then I want to look at the dictionary definition of persons. And I have it here, and I'm bringing it up if my computer will cooperate with me. Uh, what is the definition? of person and the dictionary will give seven definitions of person and I will only deal with uh, the one that has to do with theology because each of the definitions of persons uh, of person has to do with the human person so uh, when we are dealing with uh, with that then we have to look at and, and, and pick through these definitions, and there's about eight of them, and, and find the one that has to do with theology. Well, here is the definition of person, the theological definition. And I wonder if, if my friend would agree with it. It says, any of the three modes of being in the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Now, I want you to get that, and I want to pause on it for just a moment. Any of the three modes in the Trinity. Now, person defined theologically is not as we would consider a person, such as three individual human beings being three persons. But when we talk about a, a, a person in theology, we're talking about a mode. Now, many people get very upset when we talk about modalism and when we talk about the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost being but modes of one being. But you know, that's exactly the dictionary definition. And if you've got a dictionary handy there with you, I consulted three of the, of the major dictionaries. And the one that I drew, the dictionary I drew this definition from was uh, the uh, World Book Encyclopedia Dictionary, which... Uh, is a very, very good world-class dictionary. And all Webster, our, our, uh, Daniel Webster, Miriam Webster, whatever you want to consult, will say that theologically the word person means one of the modes of being of the three uh, individuals of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Well, uh, Albie, I want to ask you, do you agree with the dictionary definition of person? Now, you didn't give a very good definition of person, and you must admit, but the dictionary gives a very good definition, theologically, any of the three modes of being in the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So theologically, then, a person is a, uh, a mode of the Holy Trinity. Now, we say that God is one being. Now, the difference in you, Albie, and us is that we would say that God is a sentient being. God is a being that has rationality. God is a, a being that is re relational with his people. We call him father. He calls us his children. But your one being is not sentient. If it is, and I've made a mistake, then come up here and correct me. The only sentientness in your one being is in its three persons. 
and that since you, then there's three of those. And I yield the remainder of my time. All right. Thank, Thank you, you so sense. much for your first 20 minute segment. All right, Alvin, you're back up for your second 20 minute segment. And I will, re I will start your time when you begin to speak. All right, we're ready to go. Uh, thank you for that, Bishop Jerry Hayes. One thing I'd like to highlight is the understanding of the agreement. Uh, I thought it was that we would pose a question after uh, each session. However, nevertheless, though, I'm going to go with the flow with, uh, with what we're doing so far. I'd like to, again, address this thing he says, uh, person. I first would ask anyone, were any of the biblical authors addressing the dictionary when they were trying to write about the term person in the scriptures? What they would use for person would be face. So the face of one person, that would, that would show that that face would be person, right? Or personal. In the New Testament, we have, again, face. Now, I'm going to be going over these things. For example, I'm going to show how face, which is prosopon, and pros would be the abbreviated form of prosopon. Prosopon would reference presence, which means face. So if I were to go to, for example, Matthew chapter 18, verse 10, this is why any other position but the position of the scriptures one would have to say God is tripersonal. Now, when I say tripersonal or triunity, you're right to say that these terms are not found in Scripture. However, the biblical authors, they banked on the people who were able to read the Scriptures to count one, two, three. So they don't have to write trinity or tri-personal, tri-unity. These terms only surfaced when heresy started to raise up during the uh, during the time of the church being established, right? And in the face of these heresies, extra biblical terms were being put out there so that we are not identified with Sabellianism, oneness modalism, or Arianism. That's why these terms, if it wasn't for heretics um, raising up, in the church during these times and for the church to unite uh, unite under uh, the banner of the one true God and condemn these other heresies, these extra terms would be unnecessary. But we have no choice but to use these extra biblical terms in order to show and demonstrate that we are not oneness modalist. We are not Arianist, right? So if the word Trinity, because it's not found in Scripture, if that troubles you, then I would I would encourage you to bank on counting one, two, three, and that one God being three co-eternal persons, namely in Matthew 28, 19, go and baptize in the name, singular, the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, showing the conjunction with the definite article to show a distinction between the uh, persons, right? So now when we think about persons, Let's go with biblical definitions. And let's see if his position will still stand. However, I guarantee that uh, the Trinitarian position will stand. Let's go to Matthew 18, verse 10. Here's Jesus saying, Take heed that you do not despise one of these little ones. For I say to you that in heaven, their angels always see the face of my Father who is in heaven. So Jesus is on earth who has a face. And the Father is in heaven who has a face. And that word in the Hebrew, in the Greek is prosopon. Prosopon. So you have a face in heaven and a face on earth, right? Well, let's count. That's two. I can get into the Holy Spirit. We'll do that as time goes on. But this is where we get the words pros uh, with the in, with the state of verb in John 1.1 1, 1, being used in such a way as this it says in the beginning was the word and the word was with god and the word was god in prostanteon every time john uses it it's always a reference to face to face communion and the abbreviated form for pros is prosopon which means face so now getting into the hebrew scriptures for a second here before i segue into the new 
Let's go to Exodus chapter 23, 20 to 25. In Exodus 23, 20 to 25, here's what you have. Behold, I send an angel before you to keep you in the way and to bring you into the place which I have prepared. Beware of him and obey his voice. Do not provoke him, for he will not pardon your transgressions, for my name is in him. Name in him means his character, his nature, his authority is in him. It's not that he comes in the name of Yahweh, but that the name of Yahweh is in him, meaning that what that what Yahweh is, is what the angel is, which is why he is not able, he will not pardon your transgressions, forgive him, or allow him to get away. He has the prerogative to do that. Now, it's interesting because we look at Micah, when we look at Micah, <clears throat> real quick, 7.17, Here's what it says in regards to uh, one who pardons transgressions. It says, or verse 18 says, Who is God like you, pardoning iniquity and passing over the transgression? Is there a God like you? Well, the angel is a God like you because he is, he has your nature, he has your name in him. So now let's read 22. But if you indeed obey his voice and do all the things that I speak, then I will be an enemy to your enemies and an adversary to your adversaries. For my angel will go before you and bring you into the Amorites and the Hittites and the Perizzites and the Canaanites and the Hivites and the Jebusites, and I will cut them off. You shall not bow down to their gods, nor serve them, nor do according to their works, but you shall utterly overthrow them and completely break down their sacred pillars. 25, now keep in mind, this is still Yahweh speaking. So you shall serve Yahweh your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from the midst of you. Now, what I mentioned in the first session, notice that here the angel is being called Yahweh your God, and he will bless your bread and your water, and I will take sickness away from you. Well, if the angel is one and the same person as Yahweh, why speak with these <clears throat> personal possessive pronouns and masculine uh, pronouns in order to denote another person. Now, granted, the word person is not used in this context, but guess what? If we fast forward to the future a little bit, let's go to Exodus 33, verse 2, and let's find out, are we going to come up to a point where the persons are being identified? Let's see, Exodus 33, Verse 2, here's what it says. And I will send my angel, there it is again, I will send my angel, notice a personal possessive pronoun, I will, I will send my angel before you, and I will drive out the Canaanite, the Amorite, and the Hittite, and the Perizzite, and the Hibbizite, and the Jebusite. Go up to the land of uh, flowing with milk and honey, for I will not go up in your midst, lest I consume you on the way. For you are a stiff-necked people. So notice, he's going to send the angel before them, and I will drive out the Canaanite. So the angel is going to be sent out, and Yahweh is going to drive out the uh, Canaanites and the uh, Perizzites and the Hivites and the Jebusites. Now, in the same chapter, notice, in the same chapter, when we go to thirty-three, uh, chapter 33, 14 and 15, something interesting happens here. And I'd love to get an answer from the oneness uh, position, from the modalistic position. Here it says in chapter, in chapter 33, 14 and 15, and he said, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Now, guess what? That word, right? My face, my presence, my face uh, shall go with you. Guess what it is? That word presence, it's a plural. Why is it a plural? It's because my faces, the persons, my persons will go before you. And notice again the plural, they, they will go with you. My faces will go with you and they will, uh, my faces will go and they will go with you. And I will give you rest. So again, notice he said my presence. So my faces, they will go with you. 
and I will give you rest. Now, that's what, that's what 14 says. Now, when we get to 15, it then goes on to use the word holchim, right? Holchim, which, which means my, uh, if your faces, this is Moses speaking, if your faces, they will go, not with me, do not bring us up from here. So notice what Moses is saying. Moses understood what he's saying, that the faces of Yahweh, which means the persons who are identified as Yahweh, one is the angel, and the other one, we, need, we have to identify who that is, and we'll, we'll identify him in Isaiah 63. Now, the question for uh, any other position but the triune position would be this. Why is God referencing faces and the they who will go with them? If God is a singular being, a singular person. See, the position of the Trinitarian would be God is a singular being, but he's more than one face, person. That's the point, right? And we see even a distinction of faces, which, which means persons, before these. Now, watch this. Let's go to Isaiah 63. In Isaiah chapter 63, we're going to read, this account, 7 to 16, it says, I will mention the loving kindness of Yahweh and the praise of Yahweh according to all that Yahweh has bestowed on us. And the great goodness towards the house of Israel, which he has bestowed on them according to his mercies, according to the multitude of his loving kindness. For he said, surely they are my people, children who will not lie. So he became their face. I'm sorry. So he became their savior. So notice, Yahweh became their Savior. But according to uh, Isaiah 43, verse 11, according to Isaiah 49, 26, according to Hosea 13, verse 4, there is nothing but one Savior. One Savior who is an atemporal Savior. One Savior who saves you from sins. Right? Not a temporal Savior like Moses or like Joshua, but an atemporal. One who does save you from your sins. Now, according to that, when we continue reading, notice it says, So he, Yahweh, became their Savior in all their affliction. Verse 9, in all their affliction, he was afflicted, and the angel of his face saved them. The angel of his face, of his presence, saved them. There is the distinction right there. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them, and he bore them and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. So notice, you have Yahweh, you have the angel of his face, and you have the Holy Spirit. Those are the faces of Yahweh who are shown to be distinct from Yahweh, yet united to that one essence, that one undivided essence. So he turned himself against them as an enemy and he fought against them. Then they remembered the days of old. Moses and his people saying, notice his people means Yahweh's people. Nobody would say that Yahweh is the people. But here it says Moses and his people showing that the people belong to Yahweh. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with the shepherd of his flock? The flock is not Yahweh, but they belong to Yahweh. These are the relational terms. His flock showing that the flock belongs to Yahweh. And where is he who put his Holy Spirit, Yahweh, the person of the Father, is not the Holy Spirit, but distinct from him relationally, <clears throat> who led them by the right hand of Moses with his glorious arm, the arm being another uh, name for the angel of the Lord, who then becomes Jesus, the arm of the Lord, dividing the water before them to make for himself an everlasting name who led them through the deep as a horse in the wilderness, that they might not stumble. As a beast goes down into the valley, and the Spirit of Yahweh causes him to rest, so you lead your people to make yourself a glorious name. So notice, who causes them to rest? In this context, it's the Spirit who causes them to rest. How? Because he's the face of Yahweh, one of the faces, meaning there's a distinction, yet a plurality in the unity and the diversity of the essence of God. It is one undivided essence, right, that's co-eternally shared by three persons that are all 
attributed to creator, to savior, to redeem. All three of these are known as the one God. Let me give you some more examples of these. Now, I'd like to know, according to Exodus chapter 33, when I clearly just now demonstrated in verse 14 and 15, after reading verse 2, that that angel who is his face, why then, if God is a unipersonal God, would he say, they and my faces who will go before them? Well, it's because that one God, again, is more than one face. That's the point. So you'll have to answer for why this is in your worldview. I'm not sure if you're going to do that tonight or in our upcoming debate, but either way, we'd like to get an answer for that, a logical answer. Now, it's never in contention that Elohim is used as a plural. Of course, it's used as a plural, but it could be a plural of intensity um, in reference to nouns. That's not our issue. Our issue would be this. Why verbs, adjectives, participles are being used as a plural if God is a unipersonal God? There is no such thing as a plural, a majestic plural, or a plural of intensity when it comes to adjectives and uh, <clears throat> adjectives and verbs, participles, when it comes to a singular being, right? Except when it comes down to the Godhead, because again, the one God is more than one face, more than one person. That's exactly what the Bible teaches. That's exactly what the doctrine of the Trinity teaches. But that's exactly, and that's exactly what the ancient faith for 2,000 years going into the uh, ancient uh, Near Eastern times, like the times of the Second Temple period, what they believed. So that being said now, let's identify again who these persons are, right? Let's go here. Let's go to Proverbs chapter 9, verse 5. Proverbs chapter, I'm sorry, Proverbs chapter 9, verse 10. It says, the fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the holy ones is understanding. Well, guess what that word is in the Hebrew? It's kedoshim na kedosh. So it's the knowledge of the holy ones is understanding. And the fear of Jehovah is the beginning of wisdom. Well, according to Psalm 34, verse 7, the angel of the Lord encamps all those who fear him. So here's the angel of the Lord, right? Who we're called to fear just as much as we fear Jehovah. And the knowledge of the holy ones is understanding. Now, sticking within the same book of Proverbs, let's go to Proverbs 30 and let's read 3 and 4. In Proverbs chapter 30, Verse 3 and 4. Again, you have the plural being used. I neither learned wisdom nor have knowledge of the holy ones. Of the holy ones. Notice again, wisdom and knowledge. Again, of the holy ones. Who has ascended into heaven or descended? Who has gathered the winds in his fists? Who has bound the waters in a garment? Who has established all the ends of the earth? Notice, who has established all the ends of the earth? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? That's the plurality. That's the father and the son, right, being identified with establishing the, all the ends of the earth. But notice also, Agur is asking, who has ascended into heaven or descended? What is his name and what is his son's name, if you know? Well, Jesus answers this question. In John chapter 3, let's read 10 to 13. Here's what he says. Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. Notice, the witness is our, we, we. Why plural if God is truly a unipersonal God? It's because God is not a unipersonal God. He's a multi-personal God, right? God who has uh, <clears throat> three faces, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? So this is him talking to Nicodemus on his own. Now, with that understanding, and to understand wisdom and knowledge in the context of the Father and the Son, I'll land it with this point because time is fleeting. Colossians chapter 2, 3 and 4 
that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining all the riches of the full assurance of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And there's the Father and the Son once again. All right. Thank you so much, Albie, for your second 20-minute segment and now back to you bishop jerry hayes for your second 20 minute segment all right greetings friends and welcome back again thank you alby for that presentation first uh, i, I want to make mention concerning the uh third person pronouns that Yahweh uses in the Old Testament in relation to the angel of the Lord. And uh, I would like to say that the third person, singular pronouns, does not indicate another person from himself, although he speaks of himself in the third person. We have really not a lot of disagreement on the angel of the Lord because uh, it is our understanding from Holy Scripture that the angel of the Lord is the pre-incarnate Christ, and uh, he is the particular image of the uh, invisible God, but not another sentient being from God. He is just the uh, projection or the manifestation of God into his universe. Uh, but as far as the third person pronouns is concerned, uh, there's a multitude of places I could go in the scripture to show where they don't, uh, that does not prove a, a third person. Uh, but we'll go to the most famous section of the word of God, which is John chapter 3 and verse 16. And we see Jesus using the third person pronoun when clearly he's talking about himself. And he says here, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Now, we know that's talking about himself. He's talking about himself. That whosoever shall believe, uh, that shall believe in him. Now, him is a third person personal pronoun, but uh, Jesus is talking about himself, but referencing a him. Now, God does the same thing throughout Holy Scripture, and we have a plethora, a plethora of examples of this happening throughout the Word of God. Now, I want to get to this concept here of makers of faces he introduced the concept of faces in his last speech and also uh of ikad and i'll take this down because you know that's what i'm dealing with and you see what this perimeter of truth is it's alvi's crucible of truth this perimeter of interpretation is his crucible of truth he can say a lot of things the pluralists say a lot of things, but are they violating scripture when they say it? The concept of a God family, the concept of uh, relational persons within the Godhead. Now, in oneness theology, we do not deny relationship between the Son of Man, also called the Son of God, and God the Father. There is relationship there. That is demonstrated, but that relationship is not in the Godhead. That relationship is between the humanity of Christ and the deity of God the Father. You will never find relationship in persons within the deity. God is never referenced as a person in Holy Scripture. And thank you, my friend, for admitting that the term three or any form of the term is used to reference God in the Holy Scripture. So I'll ask another question. I don't much have a hope that it'll be answered, but I think Albie means well. I think it's true with him as it's true with me. Uh, time is our greatest opponent in any discussion that is time. However, I would ask this. Is there any scripture where the word one or any form of the word one is used to reference the deity. 
That'd be an interesting question that he would answer. Also, I am waiting for an answer concerning the questions that I pose. Which person of his triune God has uh, a saity? Do they all have a saity? I would like to have an answer to that. And I know the people that are watching would as well. Now, having said that, I want to go to our crucible of truth. I want to go to our perimeter of interpretation. And I want to go to the scriptures that Jesus said cannot be broken. And I want to look at perimeter marker number one. And I want to look at uh, perimeter marker uh, number 1.5. And I want to look at perimeter marker number 7.5 as well. Because my friend, I think, violated all three of these perimeter markers and so much more, but we will not have time to get to those at this point. And maybe we can reference them in our final uh, speech. But in number one, and that's what I want to look at here at this time, is perimeter marker number one. And uh, this is what we have. We have uh, the Shema, uh, Hero Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. And uh, this one Lord, this one Lord God, amen, has manifested himself uh, in the economy of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, that's what my friend believes as well, but with, <laughs> with a drastic bit of difference. We believe the one God is sentient, that he is the autotheos, that he's rational, and that he has unfolded himself in the economy of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Are the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost all deity? Yes, the self-same deity. Uh, are they all, is there a relationship between them? Not in the Godhead, but in the humanity of Christ, between the humanity of Christ and the deity of God the Father, there is relationship. So I'm talking about perimeter marker number one here. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Now, how does the Bible mean one? Well, we have to look at the context, don't we? And uh, in the context, uh, we have uh, local context and also universal context. The local context of Deuteronomy 6 and 4 is Deuteronomy 6 and 2 and uh, verse 10 and verse 13. And here, third person singular pronouns is used. His statues, talking about this one Lord, this one God, this one Elohim, uh, this one uh, Yahweh of Deuteronomy 6 and 4. Uh, his statues, uh, his commandments, verse 10, uh, which he sh uh, shared, verse 13, uh, shall serve him and serve, uh, share uh, his name. So here we have singular pronouns that is used concerning this one Lord God of verse uh, four. Now, when we look at the universal context of the Shema, then we have Deuteronomy chapter four and verse 35, the Lord alone, ah Elohim. Now, ha Elohim, beloved, that carries the definite article. Now, the definite article is very important. He's not just an Elohim. He is the Elohim. There is no other besides him. And then chapter 32 and verse 39, see now that I, even I am he, and there is no God with me. And then Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 3, for I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. And then uh, chapter 43 and verse 11, I, even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. And then chapter 44, verses 6 through 8, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. And we could just go on and on. Now concerning the word ikad, ikad demands the domain of both the absolute and the compound. The meaning of a word in any language is not determined by its semantical domain, but by its context. And Ikad stresses unity. While at times, uh, beloved, very few recognizing diversity within that unity. 
Now, the word is used close to a thousand times and only rarely, about 2% of the time, is it used to ed address a compound or a metaphorical one. Now, according to my count, and I'm being generous, Ikad addresses a compound or a metaphorical one only 28 times out of uh, almost a thousand. Now, is Strong's is correct. And out of a few more than that, if Jacinius is correct, about 10 more times. Now, the phrase, and I, I, I don't have time to deal with how Ikad is used and, and how it's interpreted, but to, to, to suggest that Ikad is the, the primary meaning is one in unity is ludicrous. But yet that's how that the pluralist presented presented. For over 1,500 years, the Hebrew scholars read and taught the Shema and never one time considered Ikad as referencing a unity of entities in their Godhead. Not until the development of the Trinity was the unthinkable thought and the Shema received a new reading. Now we're told that if Moses really meant that God was one, he should have used the word Yakid. Now, Yaqid is found only 12 times throughout the New Testament scriptures. And of these 12 occurrences, if my friend challenges him, we'll come back and talk more about it later. Of these 12 occurrences, not one time is Yaqid translated one. Not one time is it translated one. Therefore, the suggestion by the pluralist that Yaqid should have been the word used by Moses if he intended to say that God was one person, entity, individual. Well, we reject that out of hand because the word is never used for one. It's used for only. Uh, it's uh, Yaqid is used uh, in Psalms uh, 25, 16 to describe loneliness. It's uh, used to, to describe uh, the only my life, the only life, according to Brown, Driver, and Briggs. Uh, in, in other words, Yaqid, most importantly, the reason we reject that suggestion is it's never translated one in scripture. It has the meaning of only, only child, desolate, darling, solitary, only son, but never is rendered one. Now, it's true that the word has a meaning of only or alone, but not just that, your kid's meaning includes uniqueness and preciousness. Now, we maintain that your kid was not used to describe the unity of the deity because it would not have been appropriate. If your kid would have been used to describe God, it would not necessarily tell us how many gods there were, but what kind of gods there were. Now, Yaqed, however, is a third word for one that should have been used if uh, the intention of the Holy Spirit was to show that the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost were intended here as plural persons being one in unity. Uh, it, it, this word, yakad, yakad is the source of both uh, ikad and yakid. This word does indeed mean united together in one. That this word was available, but was not in the Holy Spirit did not inspire Moses to use it in describing Yahweh's oneness should be all telling. Now concerning, I'm going to spend my time on Elohim and on his plural arguments because his whole arguments uh, uh, stand on that foundation, or I should say hang on that tree that God is a plurality of, uh, of rational persons. And if that can be discounted, then every argument that he has made in this uh, debate can be discounted. Now, the weight of the evidence of a plural noun for God proving plurality of persons in the Godhead, uh, that's truly overstated. Because of, of what I'm about to give right now, uh, we can say that for certain. Now, the idea of this plurality uh, in the word, especially in the word Elohim, was first presented, as far as I can tell, by Bishop Peter Lombard, the Roman Catholic Bishop of uh, Paris. Uh, when was it? It was in the 12th century. Now, 
I want to uh, say this. I would ask you to notice the following, that the pagan gods are called Elohim, and I could give a battery of scripture. Moses is called Elohim, yet he's one person. Samuel Elohim. Uh, it, it, the first verse of the Bible, the third person masculine singular verb created is used for Elohim. My friend would like to say, yeah, Elohim there proves a plurality of persons in God. But because the single verb is used, it indicates that this is a plurality of intensity, a plurality of plentitude, a plurality of majesty, if you would. Now, it's used of false gods. It's used of the one true God. But when it's used of false gods, uh, plural verbs are used. When it's used of the true God, most always, and I said most always, singular verbs are used. In Genesis 1, 26, and God Elohim said, the very verb directly connected with Elohim said is third person masculine singular. Therefore, one person said, although he's called Elohim. Now, if Elohim means a plurality, a plurality of persons as Trinitarians suggest the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost together make Elohim, then only one person could not be Elohim, yet Jesus alone is called Elohim in Psalms 45, verses 5 through 7. One person wrestled with Jacob, and Jacob said, I have seen Elohim face to face. Now, the Hebrew plural Elohim, and this goes for all plurals, is uh, when it, in relation to God, is often used for a singular noun to denote a plural of excellence. Now, it's well known by biblical Hebrew language experts and has been known since the time of Jacinius, who's still regarded as one of the best authorities of uh, biblical Hebrew, that uh, Elohim, is sometimes used in a numerical plural sense for angels, judges, false gods. But Jacinius in the Hebrew Chaldean lexicon of the Old Testament, page 49, also says this, that Elohim is used 2,000 times for the plurality of majesty for God. That's what Jacinius says. And that Elohim was used in that sense occurs in a numerical in a numerically singular sense and is constructed with a verb and adjective, most generally always in the singular. And this is pages 398 and 399 of Jacinius. So the plural of excellence is, is properly a variety of an abstract plural, since it sums up the several characteristics belonging to the idea because possessing the, the secondary sense of an intensification of the original idea, it's made plural. It's thus closely related to the plurals of amplification. Now, here are some, here's some scholarship. I don't ask you to take my word for it, but this is important, and my friend needs to do some beefing up on the Hebrew language if he thinks that these plural nouns in relation to the Hebrew God represents a plurality of persons. Uh, Trinitarians, Protestants and Catholic and Eastern alike, uh, they all make similar acknowledgments to the extent of uh, Elohim and makers and, and husbands uh, being a plurality of excellence. Nelson's Expository Dictionary of the Old Testament describes Elohim the common plural form Elohim, a plural of majesty, Unger and White, 1980, page 159. International Standard Bible Encyclopedia says, it is characteristic of Hebrew that extension, uh, magnitude, and dignity, as well as actual multiplicity, are expressed by the plural, Erdman's Publishing Company, uh, 1984 edition, volume to page 1265. Today's Dictionary of the Bible, 1982, Bethany House Publishers, written, written by Trinitarian scholars, says, applied Elohim, applied to the one true God, 
It is a result in the Hebrew Elohim of a plural magnitude of majesty when applied to heathen gods, angels are the judges. Uh, Elohim is in a sense of a plural form as well. Now in my closing seconds, I'd like to get down to his idea of faces. The plural Elohim argument, and, and brother, you're going to have to just call time on me because I'm going to go till I run out. The plural El Elohim argument is no more popular, uh, proper, I should say, than the plural faces argument. When the Hebrew scriptures speak of the face of God, they invariably use the, he the Hebrew uh, plural word, which is literally faces. Obviously, according to this type of Trinitarian reasoning, to have faces, God must be more than one person. Now, it's apparent to any competent Old Testament Bible scholar that faces is used in a similar All manner right, to the That's time. Elohim. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters in Christ. All right, Albert, you're up for your third 20-minute segment, and I'll start your time and you begin to speak. All right, thank you very much, and thank you, Bishop Jerry Hayes, for that. <clears throat> now... I noticed several things throughout his uh, presentation, uh, errors that he made, which would lead me then to believe why he holds to his position, right? Number one, if you listen carefully to what he said when he quoted Deuteronomy 6.4, here's what he said. Let me just pull it up really quick. He said that, Hero Israel, Yahweh our God, Yahweh is one Yahweh. He said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one Lord. He said this over and over again. I'd like to encourage anyone, show me where it says one Lord. Why are you inserting something in Scripture that is not there? When it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, I would let it be at that and do not insert what you think that one Lord is, but rather let the Scripture speak for itself. This is why he holds to a unipersonal uh, ideology of who, God, uh, of who God is. It's because it has been planted and echoed over and over again that the Lord our God, the Lord is one Lord. Well, the word Lord is nowhere there in the Shema. So why are you inserting it? That's, a, that's an error on your part. Moreover, he also made another error in saying that we believe that the angel is a distinct being. We don't believe that the angel of the Lord is a distinct being because we believe that he is one in essence, right? It's one being. Being simply means to exist. How does God exist? He exists as three co-eternal uh, persons, namely, again, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Now, Natures do not speak, but persons do. So again, when we reference scriptures like Matthew 2.15, Matthew 3.17, Matthew 17.5, where it says, my son or my father in Matthew 7.21, over and over again, you'll notice his, uh, you'll notice the apostles saying his father or his son. Then he, then he actually laughed and mocked at God being a family within himself. He laughed and mocked and said, how can this be? Well, let me read for you 2 John chapter 1, verse 3. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with you from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. That is the heart of God, of the Father, is Jesus, the very object of his love is the Lord Jesus Christ, in which <clears throat> enemies of the gospel and enemies of the nature of God seek to try to distort and to change nothing new under the sun, ladies and gentlemen. The Satan's been after the family from the very beginning of time when he went to Eve in Genesis 3, 1, saying, are you sure God said? Split the family and you'll raise up the children in your own image. But see, praise the Lord, that in his essence, although it's undivided, we see a uh, plurality of persons that are, uh, that are, you know, one, united to that one essence. Then he went on to talk about Yahid. I never even mentioned the word Yahid until right now. 
But in regards to in regards to Ahad, in my opening statement, if you remember what 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 I read in Deuteronomy six four, and I segued into Genesis chapter eleven verse four. Notice what it says here. And they said, "Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower, whose top is to the heavens. Let us make there's not say let us make a name singular for ourselves." lest we be scattered abroad over the face of the earth. But Yahweh came down to see the city and tower which the sons of men had built. And Yahweh said, Indeed, the people are one, achad, and they all have one language, achad. One language, and, they're, and they all have one name under, under, uh, at the Tower of Babel. Well, how can that be if they're, if they're a plurality of persons? Well, that's the point. The word achad is used in Deuteronomy 6, verse 4, in order to denote that in contrast to all other false deities, there is no deity but the one true deity, right? And then I went along and I demonstrated and showed how that one divine nature is a multi-personal per, uh, multi in persons. I demonstrated faces. Again, I'm not speaking about nouns in regards to Elohim, I'm asking him, deal with the adjective and the verb participles for a singular being. You will never find it outside of God in reference to God being creators, Ecclesiastes 12.1, God being makers, uh, <clears throat> Psalm 149 verse 2. We have Psalm, Psalm 149 verse 2, Job 45 verse 10. And let me remind you again, again, what Job 31, verse 15 says. I've read this, but just for the sake of uh, the argument, in Job 31, verse 15, it says, Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? The same achad fashion us in the womb? I mean, understand what this is uh, telling you. Did not the same achad, and then I went along and I showed you how that word achad is used for the word of the Lord, for the son, even the son in Proverbs chapter 30, verse 4, and the Holy Spirit, who does what? Who makes. And yet you have Nehemiah 9, 6, Job 9, 8. You have Isaiah 44, 24 that says Jehovah alone did this. Yes, because Jehovah alone did do this in contrast to all other false deities. And he's mentioned twice in this that scripture cannot be broken. Now, it puzzles me because he would go to, he hasn't gone there, but he is quoting from John chapter 10, verse 34 and 35. Notice what it says. It says, Jesus answered and said to them, is it not written in your law? I said, you are God's. If he called them gods to whom the word of God came, now he is being identified, he's identifying himself as the word of God who came to judge these other false deities. He calls himself the word of God. Now notice what it said. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified and sent into the whole into the world? What took place first? The sanctification or the being sent into the world? Well, right here, this blows away the oneness mortalist position. Do you know why, my friends? Because the Father sanctified the Son first, then he sent him into the world. That's exactly what Trinitarians believe. That's exactly what the scriptures teach. Let me read that again in case you're confused. Do you say of him whom the Father sanctified, meaning set apart, and sent him into the world? You are blaspheming because I said I am the Son of God. Now, he quoted from, uh, what is it? Psalm 82, verse 6. Psalm 82, verse 6. Let me tell you why that's interesting. In Psalm 82, verse 1 to verse 8, I'm not going to read the whole psalm, but check this out. And for you students of the Bible, which are most of you, check this out. And I would encourage uh, my opponent, uh, Bishop Jerry Hayes, to also do the same. And prove me wrong if I'm wrong. Psalm 82, verse 1. God stands in the congregation of Il. That word Il. 
Some might translate it the mighty, some might, but the point is it's used for what? God, right? So in other words, Elohim stands in the congregation of Il. He judges among the gods. Then he quotes verse six, right? I said, you are gods and of, of you are the children of the most high. Now notice verse eight. Arise, O God, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. This God, arise, O God, this Elohim is the same Elohim in verse 1 who stands in the congregation of Il. You know what that means? That means the son stands in the congregation of his father. He judges amongst the gods. Then in verse 8, the father commands him, arise, O Elohim, judge the earth, for you shall inherit all the nations. And this is when, this is when John chapter 6, verse 38 uh, came to play. John 6, 38, it says, For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This shows that he has a will, which means he has personhood. However, the personhood, the will of the Son is to always do the will of the Father. Now, notice when this took place. It took place prior to the incarnation. For I have come down from heaven. I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. Now, this would, this would only make sense in a God being a plural, plurality sense, being a plurality of persons, showing that he has a will that is uh, to denote personhood, and that personhood... To have that will is to be set aside and to always do the will of the Father. Now, let me show you this in the incarnation, right? Here is the Son who's being sanctified and being sent into the world. That means prior to Him entering into uh, His incarnation, prior to that, He was sanctified. Not as a thought or as a plan, but as a real person as we just saw in Psalm 82. So... When we take a look at John chapter 10, again, uh, right before we go to the incarnation, when you look at a few verses beforehand in John chapter 10, 27 to 30, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. There's one hand, and I... And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, including greater than the Son. And no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father, we are one. That word are is esmen, which means a plural. So I and my Father, we are one in aseity, in essence, yet distinct in person because it shows that the Father is greater than the Son by virtue of position, not ontologically. I went over that in my first clause. Now, this poses a huge problem for the oneness position since how can a mere man, how can a mere man claim to have the divine uh, prerogative, the divine power that the Father has and yet still call the Father greater than himself? That would make no sense. So let's make sense of this in the incarnation with the time I have uh, that's before me. So in John chapter 1, verse 1, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Okay? Now, I want you to notice, I'm going to contrast John's opening in John 1.1 1, 1 with John, with 1 John chapter 1, 1 through 3. 1 John 1, 1 through 3. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our own eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled concerning the word of life, the life was manifested, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was prost on patera with the Father and was manifested to us. Notice, 
how an abstract uh, title is being given to the son, just like the word. He's, he's called the word and he's called the eternal life who was with the father. This is not a thought or a plan. To think so is an injustice to what the scriptures teach and a disservice to all those whom you teach it on. Despite, remember this, James chapter 3, verse 1, do not let many of you be teachers because with that comes greater condemnation. Let the scriptures speak for themselves and allow to be God, whether it makes sense to you or not, right? Let that let God be true and every man a liar. So here's what it says again. That which we have seen and heard, verse 3, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and Atohuyos and with his Son, Jesus Christ. Well, if the oneness position is correct, how in the world can we have fellowship both with the Father and with His Son? Notice again, the personal possessive pronoun to show relationship. How can we have fellowship with the Father and with His Son if they're one and the same person? Well, because they're not one and the same person. The Son has always been with the Father and now has been manifested to us. That's the point. So going back to John 1:1, 1, 1, clearly here we're going to make this clip, we're going to make this case. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now, remember John 1:4, in him was light, and the life, and in him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now we saw in John chapter 10, 4 and 35, Christ calling himself the Word of God who comes to judge these other gods, who's going to inherit those nations. We also know that Jesus is called the light of the world, John 8, 12. We see that Jesus is also called the life. So when we see in him was life and the life was the light of men, well, hold on. Let's go to John chapter 5, verse 26, where it says, For as the Father has life in himself, so he has granted the Son to have life in himself. Well, when was this granting of life? When did that take place? Well, the answer is not when, but it's an eternal. Since that word has always been with the Father in eternity, that granting of the life is a way to say he's begotten in eternity, not made, right? Not made, but begotten, right? So we, now we look at the life that the Father has granted to him. When did that take place? Here it is. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Now watch this. In Psalm chapter 30, uh, chapter 36, verse 9, here's what it says. Psalm 36, verse 9. For with you is the fountain of life. In your light we see light. Speaking of Jehovah, with you is the fountain of life. Now who is the fountain of life? John 7, 38 and 39, that fountain of life is none other than the Holy Spirit. That one who gives life, who's the author of life in union with the Son and the Father. Distinct in personhood, united in essence. So, John 1, 14. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Well, hold on, John. When did you beheld his glory, the glory of the only begotten? Notice, it wasn't the Holy Spirit who entered the tabernacle. It wasn't the Father who entered the tabernacle, right? It was the glory of the only begotten Son who entered the tabernacle, who is called the only begotten of the Father. And John says, we saw his glory. Well, when did you see his glory, John? Well, you don't have to guess. At the Mount of Transfiguration, in Matthew 17, verse 2, notice how Jesus transfigures prior to the Father coming on scene in Matthew 17, 5. In Matthew 17, 2, it says, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as light. Because that glory is intrinsic to him, to who he is. It's something he shared with the Father before the world was, before creation was. That what Yahweh is, the Son is. And John says, we beheld the glory of the Son, not the glory of the Father. 
not the glory of the Holy Spirit, but the glory of the Son that tabernacled among them. Now, this is this is temple language. If you understand Exodus 34, 34 to 40, you'll notice that when the cloud overshadowed the temple, the glory of Jehovah filled that tabernacle. This is what John is trying to show in John 1, 14. And in, and in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed overshadowed uh, the tabernacle, the glory of the sun filled that tabernacle. Now, how did demons recognize, how did demons recognize that glory that was in him? Now, glory is a reference to identification. Let's take a look at what the time I have uh, with me. In Mark 1, 24, we have saying, these are this is the demon responding to Jesus, saying, let us alone. What have we to do with you, Jesus of Nazareth? Did you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. Notice the demons recognized who Jesus was. Why? Because they've seen him in heaven before. In Mark chapter 5, 6 to 8, it says, As he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and worshipped them, and he cried out with a loud voice, saying, What have we to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? How did they recognize Jesus? As the All son right, of be, the most high God. That's time right there. All right, Bishop Jerry Hayes, you're back up for your final final 20 minute segment. And I will start your time when you begin to speak. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And thank you, Albi Al. Uh, I really enjoyed listening to your three affirmatives. However, however I am disappointed that you have uh, observe the Passover. I really didn't think that you were Jewish. I thought you were Assyrian. Uh, but you observed the Passover on my questions that I asked in my last two, uh, my last two speeches. And uh, so perhaps um, we'll get to those in the Q&A. And if you answer them and I miss them because my computer went blank, there for a while and it took me about a few minutes to get it back on so i do apologize but mm, i was hoping to have a little bit more lively discussion on that but be that as it may uh, i want to uh, just open this uh, segment up by talking about uh plural verbs and adjectives and so forth and so on uh, concerning plural nouns uh, and you said that it, it won't be found anywhere outside of talking about God. Um, well, I want to look at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 28 and verse 13. And note the words of the witch of Endor. And she's speaking to King Saul. Upon seeing Samuel, she explains, I see Elohim, that's plural coming up out of the earth, 1 Samuel 28 and verse 13. Here, Elohim is followed by the verb in the plural, olim, ascending. Now, yet only a single individual is referred to here, as is seen in verse 14. And he said to her, what is his appearance? And she said, an old man coming up, and he is wrapped in a robe. Thus, when joined by a plural verb, the noun may refer to a single individual. Now, let me say it again in case you missed it. Even when it's joined by a plural verb, the plural noun may still refer to a single individual. And as is the case here. Now, let me get to what my friend had to say concerning faces, a little bit more about faces. And talking about if there are faces, a plural of faces, there must be a plural of persons. Well, no, that isn't true, my friend. In uh, Luke chapter 12 and verse 56, Jesus says, you hypocrites, you can discern the face of the sky. And the word is prosopon. You can discern the face of the sky and you say, it's going to be good weather. It's going to be bad weather. Here, prosopon, referencing the face of the sky, uh, comes from its root meaning of mask or prasanna. So the sky can have many different faces. It can have many different prasannas. So when we say that there is a face of the Father, a face of the Son, 
and the face of the Holy Spirit, that does not necessitate rational persons, but it does necessitate modes of one individual's existence, which was exactly the definition of the word person concerning uh, theology and concerning the Trinity that is given in every English dictionary that I consult. So that's very interesting. Now, uh, we have talked about just about everything that he's mentioned without bringing the scriptures up as an, as, as individually and in the uh, future, perhaps that uh, we can do that. I want to talk now about uh, his concept of begotten and the begotten son of God. And if I could get there very quickly, and if you would bear with me and be patient here. Uh, well, another thing that I'll mention while I'm, while I'm looking for this is that uh, my friend talked about uh, well, he didn't talk about his proposition. He has been uh, saying a lot of things, and uh, but what he hasn't shared with us is an explanation of his proposition. Now, since the proposition has not been brought up and he's not talked about it, he hasn't proven his proposition at all, and that was his task. That was his job in this debate. His proposition says, be it resolved, the scriptures teach that uh, the one God is three ontologically co-equal, co-eternal, rational, relational persons, namely the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Now, he did not uh, define the terms that he's using here, and we really needed those terms defined. What does he mean by Father? What does he mean by Son? What does he mean by the Holy Spirit? What does he mean by co-equal? Uh, what does he mean by co-eternal? What does he mean by ontologically and all of this? So that, uh, since he hasn't even brought his proposition up, how can we say that he has proven his proposition? And he talked about the begotten son. And he uses the begotten son as though the son was begotten from eternity. But I wonder, is that the kind of begotten son that the Bible talks about. Now here in the perimeter of truth, in my friend's crucible of truth, we're going to put his concept of the begotten son right in here. And it is uh, our perimeter marker number 10.5. So what does the Bible say about the begotten son? Well, the idea is introduced in Holy Scripture in Psalms 2 and 7, where that passage says, I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said to me, thou art my son. This day have I begotten thee. Now, this is a Psalm of David, of course. Now, when the Apostle Paul references this introduction of the begotten uh, son, he does so, uh, and it's recorded by Luke in Acts 13, verses 33 through 34. God hath fulfilled the same unto us, their children, in that he hath raised up Jesus again. This is Paul's words, talking about the resurrection of Christ, as it is also written in the second psalm. And then he quotes the second psalm. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. If he wants to talk about Jesus Christ being another person with the Father back in the beginning, using the begotten son is a non-starter because it's not talking about an eternal beginning unless you're talking about the resurrection in the mind and the forethought and the plan of God. But that's not the way he means it, I don't think. So if he means that God, that the son of God was begotten somehow in eternity past and somehow that beginning does not indicate a second in order from the Father, but they somehow are co-eternal, I don't see how it helps his proposition. I see how it destroys his proposition, if that's what he means. However, the scriptures only relate the begotten Son with 
the resurrection of Christ from the dead. Romans 1 and 4, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness, that's the King Jimmy way of saying Holy Spirit, by the resurrection of the dead or from the dead. And then in Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 5, for unto which of the angels said he at any time, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Talking about the resurrection of the dead. Or Hebrews 5 and 5. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. Again, according to the Apostle Paul, talking about the resurrection of the dead. And now Revelation 1 and 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of what? Of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins, how? In his own blood. This is talking about the crucifixion, the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Then lastly, Colossians 1.18, and he is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from what? From the dead, that in all things he might have preeminence. So appealing to the only begotten son of God is no help, friend, because you want to put that back in uh, pre-incarnation. It doesn't work. You put these scriptures in the perimeter of, of uh, interpretation, and there's only one way to interpret the begotten son of God, and that is begotten from the dead. There's only one way to interpret one God and that is one solitary sentient being. He talks a lot about the word he caught. We're going to go now to uh, perimeter marker number 1.5. And this deals with the Shema a little bit more. And uh, it talks about how that uh, the word ikad, when it is translated into the uh, Greek Septuagint. Now, the Septuagint is... Uh, the Greek translation of the Old Testament. And when the word ikad is translated by the Greek Septuagint, the Greek word heis, some say heis, is used. Now heis is the masculine, uh, the nominative masculine singular of the Greek, and it can never mean more than one. Unlike ikad, Ikad is the general number for one. If you ask a Hebrew child to count to 10, the first word out of his mouth is going to be Ikad, because Ikad means one. And it can also, on very rare occasions, have a meaning of more than one thing being one metaphorically or one in unity, but that's rare, about 2% of the time. But the Greek has no such thing has no such uh, use of its of its masculine singular one the masculine singular one in greek can only mean one person it can only mean one individual so when we uh, look at every time in the greek new testament where the word one is used and in mark chapter 12 and verse 29 not only did the septuagint translate ikad Heis or, or Heis in the Shema, but when Jesus quoted the Shema in Mark 12, 29, the word that, that Mark put into Jesus's mouth for God being one is the word Heis, or the uh, Greek nominative masculine singular. Joseph Henry Thayer says that Heis means the cardinal numeral one. Where the word heist takes the place of a predicate, it means one person. Page 186, a Greek-English lexicon of the Greek New Testament. Make no doubt about it. We're putting his arguments inside the crucible of truth. And we're talking about the Shema. And we're talking about Ikad. And we're talking about how the Greek translates it. Impossible for it, it translated the way the Greek does and the way that the New Testament has it to represent more than one person. Heis is one person. A.T. Robertson, one, when masculine, sets forth the idea of the cardinal numeral one. When referring to people or beings, always 
the numeral one is implied. Page 186, volume 5, pages 526 and 527, volume 4, page 299, volume 4, word pictures of the Greek New Testament. Bauer says the masculine one means a single, only one. Page 230, Bauer's Greek lexicon. Gingrich, the masculine one, haste is equivalent to protos, which means first, only one single. The importance, beloved, of the Greek masculine one being used by John for Jesus' words uh, is, is this, is, or by Mark, I should say, and, and also by John. The Lord our God of Israel is said to be one person. Now, if uh, Ikad was meant to be interpreted as a compound one, the Greek word that should have been used is the neuter word hen, but it was not. It was the masculine word hase that was used. Now, let me say something about John 10 and 30. He's brought it up a couple of times. The pluralist may, with hope, point to John 10 and 30, where Jesus said, I and my father are one, and garner hope uh, in finding a text to support the Father and Jesus being a compound instead of a solitary one, because the word one here is indeed him. Now, we would point out that, according to the scholars Young and Vine, in, uh, uh, that one, when it is uh, uh, neuter, can also mean one thing, one single thing. doesn't have to mean a compound one or a metaphorical one. It can be one thing, because a thing is neuter. Now, just because it's required to show a plurality being one in unity or one metaphorically, it's not confined to that purpose by the requirement. So then it would be strongly argued that Jesus is saying that he and the Father were indeed the same in, in, in this sense. Jesus is saying more than that he and the Father are one person. He is also saying that they are one thing. Now, the context here, as as my friend Albie brought out, is hand. The context is hand, we agree. The idea is support, safety, protection, the work of God as the shepherd of his people. Now, Jesus had just addressed this subject earlier in the chapter and is continuing to address it here. In verses 28 and 29, Jesus spoke of his hand and the Father's hand, then said that they, the hands are metaphors for the work of Christ, i.e. the work of the Father and the work of Christ as that of a shepherd are one, their hand. Now, it's certain that the religious Jews had no understanding that Yahweh had, could have peers. So insofar as the Jews understood Jesus' words to be a claim to deity, we may be certain that it was Yahweh they understood him claiming to be. They were incensed enough to stone him for saying that he was God. Now, I'm just going to hang out here on this idea of the masculine one and the neuter one. Here are some facts from the scholars. The nominative masculine form, heis, is used throughout the New Testament to indicate only one person. Fact two, scholars confirm that heis when used of persons, means only one person. The Shema is indicating one person, beloved. Fact three, no other evidence in Scripture or otherwise has been presented in Trinitarian controversies to date to indicate that Heis ever refers to a plurality of persons. Fact four, wherein two or more persons are stated to be one in Scripture, their state of unity is described by him. This form is used to depict the unity of many members. 1 Corinthians 12, 12. For as the body is one and hath many members, and all members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. Fact five, scholars verify that hen is used when plural persons are involved. Fact six, hen is never the, the, the neuter one is never used in scripture to modify the noun God, never. Now, in plain, simple Greek, 
God conveys to the world that he's one. The evidence is overwhelming. The word chosen by John to represent Jesus' words to assert God's oneness means one person or one single solitary individual. I may have misspoke earlier and ascribed uh, 1229 to Mark when really we needed to uh, uh, place that into John's pen. There are 11 witnesses in the New Testament that say that God is one and heist is used every time. Now, I don't know how much time I have left, but perhaps I have enough to get to this. I want to talk about the power of the masculine one in Greek. Nowhere in the word of God does the masculine one denote its power to convey the idea of one person as strongly as Galatians 3 verses 20 and 28. This passage says, but God is one, heis, for ye are all one, heis, in Christ. And the pluralists jump out of their skin and say, look at this, heis is used for all Christians being one. You know, that's not one person. You know, that's a compound one. Well, whoa, don't get too excited. Thayer says, and where it takes the place of a predicate, and he gives Galatians 3.20, Weiner's grammar, and he gives Galatians 3.28, this very verse. Ye that adhere to Christ make one person, just as the Lord himself. Vincent says ye are one moral personality. In Galatians 3.28, Paul uses the masculine one to show that the whole of the church is but one individual. In this verse, it is not the unity All of right. many members. That's time right there. That's time Thank right you. there. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, thank you. All right. Thank you guys for those 20 minute responses, uh, affirmative and negative responses. So at this time, we're going to take a quick break uh, and allow these guys to take a breather, use the bathroom, get some coffee, whatever they want to do. And uh, while they're doing that, oh, also after they come back audience, they will be having a, a cross examination for those who are wondering. So uh, until they come back, I'll uh, go over a couple of announcements and stuff like that and make sure you guys are aware of some shows that are coming up here in the future, but please watch this uh, break uh, coming up. All right, so we are going to go over some announcements here. Not sure if you guys were here for the announcements, but uh, yeah, so coming up, I hope you guys are enjoying this debate so far. Um, this, uh, this has two parts to it, right? So tonight you're watching part number one and this one, uh, there's gonna be a part two next week. These two same individuals are gonna come on and continue to tackle this subject matter. And so uh, we are looking forward to that one. Uh, how do, where are my slides? Oh, there they are. And then after that, we have a uh, atheist versus Christian debate. I have David Powman and Leo coming on the Gospel Truth, and they're going to be debating, does the Christian God exist? So hopefully you guys are looking forward to that one. Uh, I know I am. Uh, David is a rather good debater uh very intelligent guy and leo from what i've seen i haven't had much interaction with leo um but certainly uh from what i've seen on his youtube channel and things like that and his interactions with other people uh they he he, he can hold his own so i'm looking forward to this debate uh, after that i have uh cory minor if you don't know cory minor cory minor is with um his show, The Smart Christian Channel. So if you are not familiar with Corey Minor, Corey Minor uh, is, he's been on the Gospel Truth before. And it's when we were talking about Marcus uh, Rogers. And so uh, he'll be joining me once again to discuss uh, confronting heretics, those out there who the church needs to be aware of and need to stay far, far away from. All right. And so that's coming up. And once again, if you have yet to hear, uh, The Gospel Truth is having a fundraiser 
So if you are interested in supporting the fundraiser, uh, the media equipment fundraiser, this uh, media equipment is to be used on the road when the gospel truth travels for debates and interviews, things like that. Uh, it is to take equipment on the road. So uh, hopefully you will find it in your heart to support the ministry from that regard. All right. Uh, another comment I want to make is that uh, I want to make sure that people understand in the live chat that um, we understand that you disagree with someone that you're watching. Some of the, one of the debaters you disagree with, right? Uh, there is no need, uh, to call them the devil or call them, uh, uh, disparaging remarks, uh, disrespectful remarks. Um, I would even say you don't need to call anyone a heretic, uh, in that regard, uh, because the idea is that we know that you disagree. Uh, in a debate, the debate opponents, they obviously feel a certain way about the position that they're arguing. And some of them feel that it's so grossly out of step that it is heresy, but you don't hear the debaters often anyway, uh, using that term because they already understand that they disagree with the position. So if you're not in a, in a live chat and you disagree with the position, remember, uh, the, the professionalism and respect spills into the live chat as well, right? So there's probably no need to call out devils and things like that. It, it's, it's ridiculous. Right. So just make sure that you're being respectful and honoring to the person you're interacting with and make sure that the uh, conversations you are having in the super chat are fruitful and respectful. There's no need for disparaging comments. All right. Because you want to respect the people, respect the people that's on the show, the two individuals that are debating and the people in the live chat. So everyone walks away with a good experience. Though you guys may disagree, you still walk away with a good experience on this platform, right? So we wanna be respectful and honoring towards each other, all right? All right, so that said, I'm uh, not sure if Albie is back. Uh, Albie, you made it back, all right, good stuff. Okay, so now what we're gonna do, we're gonna jump into a 30 minute cross examination uh, the rules for this cross X is the question cannot be no more than one minute and the person responding has up to four minutes to respond to the question. All right. But that said, if your question could be answered with a simple yes and no or yes or no, uh, let's do that. All right. So we don't want to bog down our opponent, your opponent's time uh, with a long winded question unnecessarily. All right. So that said, Albie, you're up first for your 15 minute cross X of, of Bishop Jerry Hayes. So let me pause your time so I can, all right, good. All right, so you're up first for your 15 minute cross examination of Bishop Jerry Hayes and you got the floor. Okay, thank you very much. In John chapter one, verse 30, uh, verse 32, to 34, it says, and John bore witness saying, I saw the spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained upon him. I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom, this is the father speaking to John the Baptist, upon whom you see the spirit sending and remaining on him, not remaining on me, but remaining on him. This is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. And I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. So my question would be this uh, first question to Jerry. In regards to what John the Baptist just said and what the Father said to John, is the Father trying to relate to John that the, the Spirit will descend upon himself? Or is the Spirit descending that's going to come upon uh, the Son of God? Is it the Son of God in which the Spirit comes to descend on, or does he descend on himself? And if it is himself, why is the Father pointing to another individual upon whom you see the Spirit's descending and remaining on him? Speaking of person, that would be my first question to him. Okay, give me a second to get, so when we go to these double screens, my computer just gets really messed up. Okay, you start my time now. Thank you. Uh, number one, the purpose of the vision, let's get this clear, or the purpose of the event. 
was not to uh, establish the Trinity or to demonstrate the Trinity. The purpose, as you read, was to uh, demonstrate who the Messiah was. John said, I didn't know who he was, but God gave me this sign upon whom I saw this happening, that that was the Messiah. So the purpose of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove descending upon Christ was to indicate to John and to point out to John who the Messiah was. John knew Jesus. John was Jesus's cousin. But this was like a heavenly validation that Jesus was the Messiah to John. If we make any more than that, then we've broken the context of it. If we make any more than that of it, uh, neither you nor I believe that the Holy Spirit is a bird, but uh, it was a vision that was given to John. And because it came in three, three things, uh, it was a confirmation in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. It wasn't to prove the Trinity, but it was to confirm to John the person of the Messiah. So, I, you know, in, in with that. Okay, so do I have time? Am I going to respond to that or do I, do I go to my next question? Well, you can only ask a question. Okay, yep. no problem. <clears throat> my next question would be this. In John chapter 8, 17 and 18, if the oneness position would be correct, how do you make sense of the following? John 8, 17 and 18 says, and here is Jesus appealing to the law in Deuteronomy 19.15. It is also written in your law that the testimony of two men is true. Two anthropos, two men is true. I am one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. So he goes on to identify who the two men are, and then he says, I am the one who bears witness of myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness of me. And notice how they uh, responded to him. Then they said to him, where is your father? That would have been a perfect time for him to say, well, here I am. But he says, you know me, nor know my father. If you had known me, you would have known my father also. So who are the two men that Jesus is appealing to uh, identifying in John 8, 17 and 18 as the two men in order for the Jews to understand? Well, Number one, uh, he said the father is one that bore record, bore witness of him. The father is not a man. God is not a man. Uh, the scripture from Deuteronomy is quoted. That's true. But we understand, we who have one eye and walking around since, understand that we have to allow some kind of leniency in interpreting uh, the Deuteronomy passage because even Jesus is not meaning two men when he referenced the father because the father is not a man. Um, an example is John 5 and 16. But uh, I have greater witness than that of John for the works, the same works that I do bear witness of me. Now in this example, works is a witness. I didn't say it. Jesus said his works was a witness of him. Uh, so God's not a man, so we can't hold uh, the explanation or the interpretation of that to a wooden literal interpretation of the Deuteronomy text. But witnesses are in, implied, not necessarily men, but God and man. And also 1 Corinthians 13 and 1, the Apostle Paul refers to the same injunction from Deuteronomy and says a visit or a letter from him. Different letters would uh, suffice to fulfill the Deuteronomy uh, requirement. So in Jesus, we have uh, Jesus the man, Christ Jesus, who bears witness. We have God the Father who bears witness through the works you know, that, that he does. So we don't have to have two people or two persons. I know that's what the pluralist would like to have, but you don't have that. You have 
you have different witnesses. You have two witnesses. One is the spirit of God and one is the humanity of the Christ. Okay, my next question would be this. In John chapter 15, 26 and 27 says, But when the Helper comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Right? So the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will send them. Uh, when, uh, he will send them. Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. Now, when you look at this account, taking place in Acts chapter 2, verse 33. It says, therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. According to uh, the prophecy that Peter is quoting from, Joel 2, 28 to 32, which is quoted in Acts 2, 17 to 21, it was Yahweh who poured out the Holy Spirit. How in the oneness view can... He, being Jesus, pour out the Holy Spirit if he's receiving from the Father the, uh, the Holy Spirit. All right. To understand this uh, and, and many passages in John, we have to take into account uh, where Jesus said, uh, matter of fact, I, I believe it is in John uh, chapter 17, uh, where um, no, it's not John 17, but uh, he said that uh, I have spoken to you many things and the, the, the verse slips my mind right now. I have spoken to you many things concerning the father in parables, but there's coming a time when I will no longer speak to you of the father in parables. So we must take the parabolic way of Jesus speaking concerning the relationship between him and the father. Because his purpose was is to conceal his identity as being Father God in human form. For uh, Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, although he held the morphe of God from the very beginning, yet he didn't hang on to that or cling to that, but he took on the morphe or the form of a servant. And throughout his entire earthly ministry, he was uh, sort of, if you would, uh, concealing that fact. So he spoke in parables concerning, uh, concerning his relationship with the Father. So uh, it seems like, however, your question was specific uh, concerning how could Jesus say that if he was the Father. Um, and you're going to have to call time on me, my brother, because I, I don't know where I am. Uh, but we know that Jesus yep. is the Holy Spirit. Is that it? Yep. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Albert, you go ahead and ask your question. All right. Okay. So notice what he said, that he's speaking in parabol parabolic language. And then he said, Jesus is the Holy Spirit. So then my next question would be this. If Jesus is the Holy Spirit, as you're saying, although he poured him out from the Father, I want you to understand the implications of what you're saying. You're saying that when Jesus ascends into heaven, the man Jesus is going to pour out the Father. No, but let's see what, G what John chapter 16, verse 13 and 14 says, is however, when he, the spirit of truth has come, he will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me. For he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. So if Jesus is the Holy Spirit, how will he then not speak on his own authority? But whatever he hears, he will then speak. All right. Again, Jesus is speaking in parables concerning his relationship with the Father. I'm not making that up. Jesus says that he was. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 17 through 18. Now the Lord is that spirit. Now the Lord is Christ. And where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all with an open face, beholding as it were uh, in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the spirit of the Lord. In Colossians 1.27, it 
to whom God would make known what is the riches of his glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you. Now you want to make light of that, that Christ ascended and then sent back his spirit, but he did send back his spirit, but that spirit was the spirit of God the Father as well. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And they passed through the Phrygian and Galatian regions, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And after they came to Mycia, they were trying to go into Bethania, but the spirit of Jesus did not permit them. Uh, that's from the New American Standard. Now, if you went to Joel, or Joel prophesied concerning the outpouring of the Holy Ghost, it was the Spirit of Yahweh, the Spirit of God the Father that was poured out. Yet we're told in these passages that I've just read that it was the Spirit of Christ. And, you know, I would that would be my answer. Okay, my next question would be this. In John chapter 10, verse 36 and on says, do you say of him whom the father sanctified and sent into the world? You are blaspheming. If it's true that the son is the father, then how prior to his incarnation was did the father sanctify him, then send him out into the world if the son never existed as the son prior to his incarnation? Again, it says, do you say of him whom the father sanctified? set apart and sent into the world, you are blaspheming. So what took place first? The sanctification, then being sent. How would that be true in a oneness uh, worldview when the son only existed as a thought or as a plan? Being sanctified before the incarnation is your understanding because you bring that presupposition to your paradigm. Uh, that's not what the Bible presents. The sanctification took place at his baptism. The sending took place at his baptism. And proof of that is from John chapter 17, which is the high priestly prayer of the Lord, where he prayed, Father, as thou hast sent me, even so send I them, talking about his disciples. The disciples were not sanctified and sent forth on their mission from heaven, but they were so from their baptism. And Jesus, when he said, as you have sent me, even so am I sending them, he was making that parallel, drawing that comparison. So when John baptized him, Jesus said, uh, you need to baptize me. John said, no, you need to baptize me. Jesus said, we must fulfill righteousness at this point. So that's when this setting apart happened until that Jesus was at home in his carpenter shop uh, doing his work, taking care of his family, taking care of his mother. But here he was set apart and he was sent into the world from this point. Only in your fantasies was right. there a divine counsel held in heaven and he was sent from heaven. All right, uh, Jerry Hayes, your 15 minute cross examination of Albie. All right, thank you. Okay. Let me see here. Give me just a second. Uh, believe it or not, I had it all set up and all primed, but it's gone. So we're just going to go off the cuff with this, okay? Uh, Albie, according to uh, your proposition that God uh, is the one God, is of equal and co eternal uh, ontology. Uh, could you define ontology? I've been wondering about that tonight. Yeah, it means how to exist, <clears throat> how we exist. So ontology means uh, nature, how the person exists in his nature, substance, essence. That's exactly what it means. So now when we take a look at, for example, Hebrews chapter 1, one through three, it says, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the Father by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom, through whom 
also he made the worlds. That's to show you that the sun was there when he made all the worlds, right? The agency of the sun was used in order to make all the worlds, not a concept of thought, not a concept of a plan, but rather in person. Then the author of Hebrews goes on to say, who being in the brightness of his glory and the express image of his nature and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had uh when he had by himself purged our sins sat down at the right hand of majesty on high so here's the thing how can he be the brightness of the glory of his nature if he doesn't share in that one nature since isaiah 42 verse 8 says that yahweh does not share his nature with anyone and yet it says here being the brightness of his glory and the character, the express image of his nature. Well, my friend the one from the oneness position could never show me or show anyone one place in Scripture where the word image is being used to denote one and the same person, but it's always a reflection of another person to show that the image of the Son is the image of the Father, which is why he shares in that one nature, in that aseity, which is only exclusive to other, to the Son and to the Spirit. In that sense, they are one ontologically in essence. All right. Is the uh, in your concept does each? I, I know that you have said. I just need clarity, and it might sound like a redundant question, but the ontology being equal and the way that your proposition was worded was a, a little bit uh, not clear, a little bit confusing. Uh, is it only one ontology or do each have their individual ontology that are, are e that, that is equal? Yeah, so it's one ontological essence. So the ontology of God, it's one undivided essence that's fully shared by three co-eternal persons. Yet within the Godhead, although all three are fully, fully uh, shared in that divine essence, there is distinction in person. Hence, the Father being positionally greater than the Son, as we see in John chapter 10, verse 28. He is greater than the Son. In what way is he greater than the Son? By virtue of being the Father rather than the Son. So the Father sends out the Son and the Spirit, and the Son and the Spirit are always doing and exercising that one co uh, eternal will within the Godhead, which is the will of the Father. Now, they each have personhood, which is why we see personal possessive pronouns being used for each individual in order to liken one another in relation to one another. And this is the basic understanding of what the Scriptures teach. For example... When we go to John chapter 10, again, when we go to John chapter 10, verse 26, it says here, that, or in 27, it says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall anyone snatch them out of my hand. There's one hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all, and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. One in what way? One in power, one in essence, one in, uh, you know, one in salvation. They each possess the omni attributes in order for each one of them to be with the saints where they are, omnipresence, omniscient, omnipotence, so that... They will protect them by being in their hand. And the Father, showing that the Father is greater than all, including than the Son, that shows distinction between the Father and the Son, making the Father greater than the Son by virtue of being a distinct person, yet not an ontology. All right. Uh, are all? Th I think that I've heard you say this a couple of times just quickly in, 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 in passing, but I want to ask you specifically, I'm interested in aseity. So, uh, which which one of your persons have aseity, or do they all three have aseity? 
when you're saying aseity, so all three persons share that one undivided essence. I can't get uh, as is, clear. Is it? I'm sorry. Yeah, I, I can't get as clear as that can be. So it's again that essence. It's one undivided essence that's fully shared, fully shared by three co-eternal persons. Now, proof of this simply is here. When we read Colossians chapter two, verse nine, for example, notice that it says that for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Now that what makes God, God, Theotokos, that Theotokos, that what makes God, God, that divinity, it's fully in the son as it's always fully in the spirit and the father, because previously, a couple verses prior to that in Colossians chapter two, Verse 2 and 3 says that their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love and attaining to all riches of full assuredness of understanding to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ, showing distinction in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Notice that it says to the knowledge of the mystery of God, both of the Father and of Christ. So it's not that the Father is fully in the Son. Or the Holy Spirit is fully in it. That's not what it, that's not what Colossians 2.9 is trying to say. Colossians 2.9 is saying that what makes God God, that divinity, that aseity, that is fully in the Son as it is fully in the Spirit and fully in the Father. Would each one be a say without the other two? You cannot dismember any members of the Godhead without then um referencing another god god references one god one god and that one god to be like for example that name jehovah all three persons are named are called jehovah scriptures all three let me give an example of this i'm going to go to zechariah chapter 2 verse uh, 10 and 11 so in zechariah 2 10 and 11 it says Sing and rejoice, O daughter of Zion, for behold, I am coming and I will dwell in your midst, says Yahweh. Many nations shall be joined to Yahweh in that day, and they shall become my people, and I will dwell in your midst. Then you will know that Yahweh of hosts has sent me to you. So notice that Yahweh is sending Yahweh, however, showing a distinction of persons, however, how can the same? How can Yahweh be uh, be identified as one who sends Yahweh? Well, because the theology of who God is is by nature He is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, three distinct co-eternal persons, in which we see uh, subordination within the Godhead to uh, you know the one Father, the Spirit. Uh, is submissive to the will of the Father. The Son is submissive to the will of the Father. They're always doing the will of the Father. Okay. Uh, Albie, this is this question might get a little invo involved, so I'll, I'll try to make it as clear as possible. Do you pray to, there's an individual, do you pray to and ask petitions of three distinct persons who each is God within himself. Okay. Now, do I pray to, well, forget about what I do. Let's go with what the authors of the Bible do. Okay. So what did the Bible, what did, what do the authors of the Bible do? Here's what they do in every salutation, right? you'll see the Father, the Son, or, or even the Holy Spirit be mentioned. These are prayers. Salutations are prayers to God to bless the people. Now notice in Numbers chapter 6, verse 27. I'm sorry, Numbers chapter 6, 22 to 27. Here's what it says. And Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his son, saying, This is the way you shall bless the children of Israel. Say to them, Yahweh bless you and keep you. That's one. Yahweh keep his face, uh, make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Two, Yahweh lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's three. So you shall put my name 
on the children of Israel, and I will bless them. That's three times you mentioned the name Yahweh, yet it's likened to one name. Because again, the three persons of the one God is the one Jehovah. Distinct in persons, yet united in essence. This is why we see Matthew 28, 19, go and baptize in the name, singular, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So let me show you an example of these prayers being made to all three persons. In 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 14, here is Paul praying to all three persons. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Well, if God is a unipersonal God, why then invoke all three persons? Well, because the one God is more than one person. So here's Paul invoking all three persons in prayer. But wait a minute. It doesn't stop there. Revelation, John the Revelator does the same thing. In Revelation chapter 1, verse 4 and 5, it says, John to the seven churches which are in Asia, grace to you and peace. Remember, these divine blessings only come from Yahweh. Grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. That's the Father. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne, that's the Holy Spirit, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead and the ruler over all the kings, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood and has made us kings and priests to his Father, to his God and Father, and to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Notice again the prayers being made to all three persons. Now what we also find in Scripture is Romans chapter 8, verse 26 and 27, where we have the Spirit who's on earth, another helper that Jesus promised us in John chapter 14, verse 16, another helper. Well, who's the first helper? Well, in 1 John 2, 1, Jesus is the first helper who's prostan patera. So here's the other, here's the here's another helper, the Spirit, who it says in Romans 8, 26, likewise the Spirit who also helps in our weaknesses, for we do not know what we should pray as we ought, but the Spirit himself makes intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. Now he, God, who searches the hearts, knows what the mind of the Spirit is, because he makes intercession for the saints according to the will of God. Here is the Spirit of God making intercession on behalf of us to God, having his own mind in order to show distinction. Now watch this. Intercession. He's making uh, intercession to God. Is that time? Or one minute? Yeah, yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. You're about there, Al. I have, okay, I have one more question, and it can just either be just a one-word answer. Uh, does the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit have their own divine spirits? Um, absolutely not. It's the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, by their divine nature, are spaceless, placeless, shapeless, formless. They are the invisible God. Scripture references them as they and as he. It is the one God that's undivided in, in essence. And when we reference spirit, that is a term to denote his spirit, to denote the relationship between the spirit to the son and the spirit to the father, which, we which is why we have, uh, for example, in Galatians chapter 4, verse 4 to 6, it says, But when the fullness of time had come, God sent forth his son, Right? Ex apostolo, God sent forth his son out from himself, born of right. a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law. And then in six it says, and because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts. Notice the relationship, the relational terms that are being used. In order hey, to I'll be, go, go ahead. Hey, I'll be, go ahead and wrap it up because time did expire. So make sure you wrap it up real quick. Okay. Well, on that note, I'll. I'll go ahead and land it with that point. So thank you very much. All right. Thank you guys so much for the cross X and I hope that the audience enjoyed the cross examination. All right. So now we're going to do, uh, I'm going to ask a question for Albie 
and one question for Pastor uh, Bishop Hayes, all right? And that would be our question from the audience because it's already three hours in and uh, we don't want to go too long. So we do have a super chat here and this question is for Albie first. Uh, thank you, Stando Scripture, which I think is Taylor Stewart. Thank you so much for the support, Taylor. Uh, question for the Syrian guy, which is Albi. Do you realize that the plural words in Hebrew are not always translated to plural in English, such as panim or Elohim? Okay, so that question is to me. So again, I don't know why he's focused on the noun Elohim. That was never my argument. Hey, hey, However, sorry, sorry, I mean to cut oh. you off. Both both of you get one minute to respond to the question. To one minute to respond to this to the question. Okay, yeah. So I don't know why he would keep referencing Elohim as um, as though I'm referencing the plural word for Elohim. That's not my argument. My argument is not whether or not Elohim is a plural and used of a uh, singular, but rather why the plural verbs and adjectives, like for example, holy ones in Proverbs chapter th uh, 30, verse three and four, are referenced to both the father and the son. I'm not saying that can't be referenced to angels, but if God is truly a singular person, then why is he called uh, the holy ones in, for example, Joshua 24, 19, in Proverbs chapter 30, verse three and four, and in regards to faces, he would have to answer for why Exodus 33, verse 14 and 15, the word pane is faces and ye liku, which means they, the faces of God that they will go before him. And in Isaiah 63, 7 to 14, we see that it's the Yahweh, the angel of his face and the Holy Spirit who go before Israel. All right, uh, Bishop Hayes. Uh, the Hebrew showed intensive degree and plenitude with plural nouns. And to take the plural nouns as like face or like uh, uh, Elohim or uh, what was some of the things uh, that Albi used, makers, and I don't think he introduced husbands in this discussion tonight. But to say that because that they are plural, it must be plural persons, shows a weakness in understanding uh, the Hebrew language that could not show comparative degree much better than most good, uh, but uh, like that. But they to give a word a special meaning, they made it plural, and this happens all time with God and His face, so forth and so on. All right, and this would be a question for you, uh, Bishop Hayes. Thank you for the question. That's uh, for both, but obviously you both will get to interact with it. Uh, so I think it's directed to, more to Bishop Hayes, though. Uh, Isaiah chapter four, Isaiah chapter forty-one, verse four, and chapter forty-eight, verse sixteen describes God as the first and the last. In verse sixteen, God referred as quote unquote me is distinct from Lord God and his spirit. Doesn't this affirm God equals three in one? No. Quick answer. <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, I'll be out. Any thoughts? Okay. So yeah, n notice how in Isaiah 48, 16, it's the spirit and the one being sent. He's being sent by Yahweh, right? He's been there from the very beginning. He hasn't spoken in secret. Well, if you look at Isaiah's account in Isaiah chapter 11, verse one through three, Isaiah 42, verse one, Isaiah 61, verse one, it's always the Messiah endowed with the spirit and being sent out with the spirit. That's the point. In Galatians chapter four, four through six, you notice that he's being sent out. The son is being sent out. Then the spirit is being sent out. So if if the oneness position is correct, then in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, where it says, yet for us, there is heis God, the father of whom are all things and we for him and heis gurias, Jesus Christus. Notice the distinction. If the, if the oneness position would be correct, then we only have one God, the father, as Paul is saying of whom are all things. However, Paul doesn't stop there. He goes on to say, and one Lord Jesus Christ, heis 
Kodios Jesus Christus, in which my friend Jerry said that God cannot be uh, heis in more than one person. Yet Paul says, no, Jerry Bishop, you're wrong. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, it's heis patera, uh, heis theos patera, and heis kurias Jesus Christus. One God the Father, one Lord Jesus Christ, in which all creation came into existence. That is the one true God in union, of course, with the Holy Spirit, as Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians 2, 10 and 11. All right, guys, uh, we're going to conclude the debate there and awesome job. I think the audience enjoyed it um, and I appreciate both of you guys. And this is not the end of this debate, right? Uh, next week, we'll be having part two of the very same subject. So uh, if this debate is any indication of how part two is going to go, then uh, we're definitely in for a great doozy of a debate. So I do appreciate you guys. Uh, so I'm going to let you guys go. Uh, any closing words before I do so? Uh, I want to yeah. thank you for giving us this opportunity and making this platform available to us. Nothing suffers from examination except error. So if uh, I think, and I thank Albie for participating as well. Yeah, and I'd like to say, you know, I want to thank the God and Father of my Lord Jesus Christ, you know, for uh, giving me the breath to do this. And I'd like to thank you, Marlon, and thank Bishop Jerry Hayes. You know, I, I am emphatic on calling God a family because he's made Adam to be in his image, as, as Paul says in Ephesians 3, 14, right? that we are made in that image, God being a family within himself. Me not having a family growing up, I take it very seriously when somebody comes and tries to uh, take the scriptures and to rob the father of this eternal relationship with the son. That's heartbreaking to me because we've all been called into this eternal love, love being an object, a verb, an action that has to be taken place before creation came into existence. And that love has always been there between the Father and the Spirit. That love is what God is calling all of us into. However, we have to have the true God in mind and not a false God. All right. All right, guys. I'm going to let you guys go. I hope you guys enjoy the rest of your evening. And uh, I think some of you, I think you guys are on the East Coast, right? I'm on the West Coast, and it's only 8.30 over here. So hopefully it's not uh, too late over there where you guys are at. But nonetheless, I hope you guys have a, a great rest of the evening, and uh, God bless you guys, all right? All right, God bless you too. Thank you. Right. Thanks, guys. All right, another great show in the books, folks. Uh, this was a fantastic discussion. And I think what I appreciated about the discussion was the very fact that they wasn't talking over each other. I, I mean, if... If there's anything that uh, bugs down a debate and frustrates a debate and conversation is when they are speaking over each other. Uh, if you're like me, I'm just pulling whatever hairs I have left. I'm pulling them out because um, I like to hear what they have to say. I like to hear the arguments and I like to appreciate the arguments that they uh, that people that they make. Right. And so how can I not do that and interact with the audience, uh, interact with the arguments if I can't even hear them because they're speaking over each other? Um, nonetheless, I just believe that uh, this was a great debate and I'm looking forward to part two of this debate so everyone that's in the chat i think we peaked out in the live chat at 152 viewers so how about next week same place same time you show up in the same mass that you showed up this time and we do this once again because i'm sure that uh not only am i looking forward to it but uh albie and bishop uh jerry hayes is looking forward to it as well and i hope that you are all right uh, that said, I'm going to get out of here and I will uh, hopefully uh, make sure you subscribe to the gospel truth and the way that you get notified of the show of, uh, for example, uh, part two of this debate is if you hit that notification bell or that notify button on the actual debate that you're looking into that you want to watch, make sure you don't miss. So hit that. 
Hit the subscribe button on the gospel truth so you don't miss anything on the gospel truth and hit that notification bell on the debate you don't want to miss all right please do that also if you're looking to support the ministry the fundraiser all the information is in the description of this video so make sure you do that to support the ministry lastly before you leave hit the like button all right the like button is the algorithm maker that's what creates algorithm so as you if you appreciate this debate and you thought this debate was a blessing hit that like before you bounce off this channel okay please do that please do that all right with that said i'm out of here may god bless you may god keep you going